Ms. Saida, am I unmuted? You are, David. We can hear Thank you. you. Thank welcome. you. <clears throat> we haven't heard from Jane, right? No, not as yet. Okay, well, Anthony is going to take one of the um, applications. Okay. <clears throat> We're already streaming, so we can go ahead and start right at 6.30 um, if you'd like. Well, if you want to be the official timekeeper, according, uh, according to my watch, we have two minutes. Yes. Do we have a quorum in our committee? We had one, two, three, four right up front. That's correct, four. Okay, David. Thank you, Saida. Welcome everyone to the February meeting of the Landmarks Committee. We are here to look at three applications and to consider them with respect to appropriateness and context. I do have to thank everybody for giving up their Valentine's dinners to come to this very important meeting. And with that, I think, whoops. You can go ahead, David. Yeah, but I lost my, um, I lost my, here I go. I had lost my image. Ah, I don't know, okay. For some reason, for some reason it, it fell off my computer screen and, and it finally came back. Um, <clears throat> in any event, uh, our first application is uh, 112 East 75th Street, by Blinder Bell Architects, a modern style building designed by Schumann and Lichtenstein and erected 1964 to 1968. Application is for an addition to enclose an open air space and for window replacement. And is somebody here from Bayer Blinder Bell? Um, yes, we have Elizabeth, one second. Let me get everyone unmuted. You, hi everyone, um, you unmuted the wrong presenter. So you should unmute Liz Lieber. Uh, I see, okay, thank you. Okay. I'm here now. Welcome. Hello. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you. You should have the ability to share your screen. Um, I think our issue is that Steve McHale is sharing the screen from our group because he's presenting the second half. Mm -hmm. Do you need to give him sharing rights? 
he should be able to share. Steve, you got, are you having challenges, Steve? It says it's disabled screen sharing at the moment. Okay, how about now? Oh, yes. Okay. All right. Can okay. we all see? Yes, yes, thank you. We're all set to go? Yes, we okay. are. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everybody, and thank you so much for the opportunity to present tonight on your agenda. We're gonna be presenting Temple Israel's um, presentation to you in advance of going to the Landmarks um, Preservation Commission. Um, I do wanna just note for the record, who is here representing Temple Israel. So I am Liz Lieber, partner at Bayer Blinder Bell, and I'm accompanied by Steve McHale, principal and project manager, who will be presenting the second half of the presentation, and Elizabeth Kim, who's the project architect, who is here to listen. Also here to listen, we have a, a whole host of folks. We have Andrew Hoffman, who's the chairman of the board, the past president, Building, on the building committee, and he will be our spokesperson for tonight if any questions come up that the owner needs to answer. Um, we have Heather Getman, who is the president of the board, Neil Goldmacher and Rob New, who are both board trustees, both on the executive committee and the building committee. We have Lara Nuttall, our executive director for Temple Israel, Irena Altschul, the cantor, Elliot Sherwin, the director of operations. Rabbi Gelfand would be here, but he is on vacation. So uh, there are plenty of people here um, supporting Temple Israel's submission with me. So we're going to launch right into it now. Next. Um, so I think everybody knows where Temple Israel is on 75th Street between Park and Lex, um, firmly within the historic district boundary that was established in 1981. Next. And you can see it here um, in a map that predated the construction of the temple when two garages, it says urban garages were here. Um, and just going back in history a little bit, it wasn't until 1910 that Park Avenue was really considered to be um, the kind of avenue that, of residential uh, focus that it is today and has been for the, since then, um, it was actually had depressed rail tracks on it. So the development of this block has been, has been noted in the designation as having um, grown and become residential um, from that time onward. Next, um, this is a designation for a report. This is from the block history from 1981. And as it says that it reflects the fluctuating character of the blocks and notes, the most unusual building on the block is Temple Israel, which was built 1964 to 1966 um, by Slice's a predecessor firm, Schumann and Lichtenstein. Next. Um, and here's from the designation report of the individual landmark, it's uh, of the individual building itself, a contributing building in the district. Um, it gave it the modern style. Interestingly, it um, says that it is concrete facing, which it was not, it was limestone facing and still is. Um, and uh, it notes the opening at the ground floor with a recessed curved wall and a blank wall at the building line for three stories, which we think are the notable characteristics to keep in mind as we move forward. Next. Here are also some photos. Actually, if you go back one, Steve, I just want to note that in the historic photo that we were showing there, this is before the um, fence was put up in 1991. And you can see it's unfenced and open. And um, this photograph most notably shows um, the hovering blank wall, the three-story wall um, above that sort of void, essentially the dark void, um, which makes a characteristic of brutalist buildings of the time, um, but also creates a void that's um, fairly inhospitable from the street. Next. Um, and then we always think that these, going back into the archives to look at these uh, very aspirational renderings um, from the dedication, we show the, the sunlight glancing over the drum of the building, which is a wonderful um, representation of the party, but maybe not a, quite a realistic depiction of how it is um, seen today from the passerby and some other photos that we found from the archives from 1967 as well, pre-gate. Next. Um, changes over time, the only significant change um, from a jurisdictional point of view in the building since its, um, since its construction was the addition of this gate that we mentioned that was actually done by Slice um, and did get a certificate of appropriateness in 1990 and was built in 1991 as a sort of uh, preliminary um, security gesture. Um, so that's what exists today. 
And then you'll see the aerial view, just uh, showing the building as it's situated on the block and that the roof plan shows the partie of the drum um, that extends from roof down to the ground floor. And then the views which show, we're just noting here, the Northeast aerial view, which shows the primary facade on 75th street and the secondary facade with very, very, very limited view from a public way um, on the rear. Next. And then as requested, a site plan, just a black and white site plan showing the project site. Next. And as well, a panorama showing um, its neighboring buildings from blocked from avenue to avenue, three significant residential buildings with significant facade lengths, and then our building, the only institutional building on the block. So our proposal for an enclosing the courtyard with a storefront, we'll go to first, next. So this is the original North Elevation drawings that were done. Um, and it shows the open courtyard unfenced and then the setback of the drum, which is a sort of continuation of the drum of the sanctuary at the ground floor, the limestone facade with its jointing as it is today. And then we do note the existing entry doors, which are recessed quite deeply into um, the ground floor courtyard, um, which we will be removing as part of our submission, as you'll see that we bring the vestibule forward to the street line. Next. So here it is today, just showing the gate, which um, rather than picking up the, on the jointing of the limestone facade, chose to pick up on the scale and even the geometric design of the Daldever or stained glass windows that are on the drum. Next. And these are existing conditions photos from you know this, this day, this past year or so. Um, so you can see the existing conditions with the fence. Um, with the unarticulated facade, um, largely no changes to it, with the minimal Temple Israel sign, and then some images within the fence to the courtyard, both looking east towards what is a service entrance, and then looking west, which is towards the main entrance, as well as you can see on number three, what is a makeshift security situation, where there's a temporary booth um, there are usually some folding tables, um, there's security with wands and um, checking for people who are going inside. It is quite makeshift, it is unweather protected. And you can also see in the middle photo that this space is used by Temple Israel, but is of course subject to, to the weather to say the least, as well as other factors. So let's move forward. So we wanna start with the full, full existing first floor plan. This is something that we had in the appendix. And I just wanna note that we did submit this to the community board just a few hours ago, but moved these into the front because I think that it really helps to tell the picture, the whole picture. So the existing first floor plan, you can see of course that the building was designed around the sanctuary itself, which is contained within this ellipse within what we call the drum. But if you can see by the grid of the terrazzo flooring that circles it, that there's really very little space on the ground floor that's actually enclosed. Once you get in from the main vestibule, then you come in and it's really incredibly tight squeeze to get people in and out of the sanctuary, which of course is the heart of the structure itself, as well as circulating around to get to the elevators. Um, the courtyard itself is quite large, but um, it actually gets used a whole lot, despite the fact that it is not weather protected. But of course, the fact that it isn't constrains its use. So those are existing conditions to explain why on the proposed plan, which is the next one, we're proposing to enclose the space. And I would say it's for three main reasons. The first being programmatic. This building was built when 150 families were congregants of Temple Israel. They are up to 630 families now. Um, you can, it's extraordinary pressure on this building itself. And you can imagine both for regular services as well as special life cycle events that it is very congested and very difficult for them even to have the types of events that they want to have and the pre and post function gatherings that they wanna have with the space that is on the first floor. Why the first floor? We would like to do more of this where we don't have to deal with accessibility issues with people going down or upstairs or making their way to the elevator. So this is quite precious space 
for Temple Israel to use. Secondly, not being able to circumnavigate the entire sanctuary from the outside makes for confusion. It is a very confusing building despite the simplicity of its plan. And so we think that by enclosing this space, people will better understand how to use the building. And thirdly, about security. And you'll see that we've introduced a vestibule that's not only a weather protection vestibule as is required by code, but also to house security, two people in security, magnetometers, as well as navigating a level change. Because by setting, by enclosing the space, we have to level it out right now. It slopes down to the sidewalk. So we have these vestibules that are doing a whole lot for us. Um, on the plan left side, we have the entry, a secondary entry vestibule. Um, Temple Israel doesn't have the benefit of having a side alley. So service comes in and out of their front facade as it is with many buildings in New York. So we have to create a service vestibule for trash and recycling and deliveries to come in. But we also intend on using this second vestibule for days in which there's pressure to get people in and out, say on the high holy days, this will become a very valuable second entrance as well. So it's designed both as a service entrance as well as a secondary public entrance. Next, so we're gonna uh, zoom in now to um, the um, point in question, which is the storefront. This is the existing floor plan, which is showing you that the fence that was built in 1991 is situated exactly on the property line with no recess whatsoever, except at the gates which are shown with the, with the swings as well. You can see that they're minimally recessed. Um, so this is showing just the layout as it is today. You can see the deeply recessed main entrance. The next page shows our proposal, which is to remove that fencing gate and to construct a new storefront that's offset one foot six inches from the property line. The purpose of this setback is to emphasize a shadow line so that we can keep the integrity of the blank three-story limestone facade above and recess the storefront below. We did this both in terms of making that aesthetic shadow line, but we're also balancing that with the need to retain as much space as we can because we have dimensions that we need to comply with for secure, the entry vestibule and the security and the ramp. So that puts pressure on how big that vestibule is. So we don't really have much dimensional tolerance with these vestibules. So that helped us to set the storefront as well. You'll also see before we go to the elevation, sorry, Steve, if you can go back one, that we have two aspects of this facade where we are um, suggesting that we would have um, instead of clear glass, there's only two limited areas where we don't have clear glass. Instead, we have spandrels. To plan uh, left, we can start over there. There is a mechanical shaft and closet. This is the only way that we're being able to get down into the cellar um, that exists today in terms of mechanical equipment. So we would like to blank that off. And then on the other side, um, we have security, which has a desk and has closed circuit TV cameras and has security equipment. And we feel it's for the best to blank that off as well to provide some protection for the security equipment not being seen from the street. So I just wanted to note that before we now move on to the existing and proposed elevation. So you can see existing above and then down below is our colored elevation. Um, so we have a ballistic glass rated storefront um, the dimensioning of that storefront, which I'll go into in a little bit, but just overall, you can note that we've aligned it with the jointing on the right, thank you, um, on the joints right above the storefront itself. It's separated from the limestone, not only by the setback, but by a continuous louver, a horizontal louver that goes end to end to those little end walls that actually exist today of limestone. That's the only place where the limestone connects down to the street and we're going to retain that as well. And that is minimally recessed, but not as deeply as our facade. And then you'll see, as I noted, the two sets of spandrels to the left and right, which provide us those blank panels so that we can hide the equipment and the shaft beyond it. And you can see the two sets of doors coming into the main entrance and into the service entrance itself. So that's the big overview. And I should note also that the new signage that we're proposing is in the existing location in the, um, and in the same size as it is today. So not a significant change to, to signage. Um, I think we can move into the 
Jess, I wanted to put something in that zooms in a little bit because I know that these are hard to, to look at at the middle scale. So we're just zooming in to show um, the, the minimal signage that we're putting on the glass to indicate the building address and then up on the limestone to indicate the building name. Um, the idea to have an interlayer in the spandrels so that it will blend with the bronze color of the storefront itself, but that we wanted to give a little bit of visual interest to these areas instead of just purely blanking them out. And when we go into the zoom in, I can tell you a little bit more about that. And just to the left of where Steve is pointing out the spandrels, there's also a strip of bulletin board that will be accessed from the inside so that we can post notifications of events that are going on and activities as well. Next. So these are sections going through both the existing conditions of the gate to the left. So um, if you're looking at the sections, the left side of the section is the street side. The right side of the section is the building side. And you can just see that the, um, the property line, the limestone facade is on the property line and the gate is just um, actually four inches back from the property line. And then to the right are proposed, which makes no change to the limestone facade, recesses the storefront between the recess of the storefront and the limestone facade, we are installing a very minimal light fixture, a strip LED with a warm light that will allow us to shed just a small amount of light onto the sidewalk in just this location only with a hidden fixture. And then we have the storefront itself, stepping 18 inches back, and then a granite base. And that granite base navigates the level change, which is fairly significant across the site itself, which I'll point out as well. Next. So here are some details of the storefront. We're just zooming in to show you a typical bay, which is about the, the glazing itself is about eight foot 10 by six foot five with um, a 14 inch horizontal louver going across. That louver is mostly inactive across the facade, but we wanted to have it to have visual continuity so that the active portions and the inactive portions look the same. Um, on the right, you'll see a plan detail of a typical um, mullion, which is two and a half inches wide. And you'll see right where Steve is pointing, that's on the exterior side of it. So it's a fairly minimal cap for both the size of the glazing, the height of it, and the depth of it, which is a two and a half inch um, composite system of glazing for ballistic protection. Next. These are our proposed finishes. So we have the limestone of the existing facade. Um, we have the watercourse base, which navigates that level change and the storefront sits on top of that. We're um, suggesting a flamed Picasso granite because it is a dark color with veins of browning that we think will complement the bronze color of the storefront. Um, we have a dark oxidized bronze for our hardware to complement the storefront as well. And the storefront itself is a metal with a dark bronze coating, a shop coating. The spandrel panels, which you can see on the bot, thank you, Steve, the bottom center, um, is just a very, very subtle um, pattern. We wanted to choose something from the sort of organic shape of the drum and then create a geometric pattern from which we could um, connect the dots essentially to um, refer to the Star of David in a very subtle way um, and not across the entire pattern. But it's something that gives a little bit of life, um, a little bit of pattern and a little bit of warmth at the entrance and a referral to reference to the softer organic geometries that are inside of the building when you get to the drum and the sanctuary. And then finally, the glazing on the bottom left, left which as I said, is an uh, insulated glazing unit, which is ballistically rated and does have a low E coating on it for energy. Next. So now we just place those two um, against each other, the proposed elevation at left for the whole building, the historic elevation at right. Um, and I think that these, what these elevations don't adequately show is of course how light is going to affect um, the way that you perceive the storefront. So we have some um, renderings that I think better tell that story. So here you can see the existing 75th street entry itself with the gate and we give you that view so that we can show you the comparable, a comparable review 
review of the rendering. And I think what's interesting about putting up the glass storefront is that during the daytime with the reflectivity of the glass, the low E coating creates a little bit of reflectivity. Um, and of course, it's a very thick insulated glazing unit. Um, the, the daytime effect we believe will be like that kind of void that's, um, that's listed in the designation report and is an element of this brutalist character of the building. But at night, if you go to the next one, through very subtle lighting of that courtyard space that becomes enclosed, um, you're able to have a little bit more uh, visibility inside and a little bit of shedding of warmth of light onto the street. And of course, a space for Temple Israel to use uh, for their programmatic needs. So that was um, quickly going through the storefront itself. I think we're gonna continue on with the window replacement package, which I'm gonna hand over to Steve and then we'll open it up to answer any questions you have. Hi, good evening. Um, so there is a program to replace um, most of the windows in the building as part of the overall renovations. Um, and these are typically um, punched or strip window openings. Um, the existing are shown here in the facade and they remain to this day. Um, what we're looking at, as you're already familiar, uh, is the 75th street facing elevation of the building, um, the, the primary facade as uh, the Landmarks Preservation Commission might determine it. And um, on the, will, the windows that are visible um, from the public way are you know, those on the rotunda element um, that's perched on top of the building mass. And there's also a setback level, um, at what is called the second floor, um, which is also going to be impacted by the renovations as well. Um, here you can see that uh, in the current condition, um, the original windows sort of remain pretty much unchanged um, since they were installed with the exception of some modifications to allow for uh, through window AC units, um, which will be removed as part of this program as well. So the main drivers between this, um, apart from just improving the appearance of the building, were also an environmental and um, energy efficiency. Um, while the building has been determined to be not um, subject to sort of mandatory sections of the New York City Energy Conservation Code um, by virtue of its historic status. Um, we still aspire to improving the efficiency and the performance of this building um, and to work towards local law 97 um, compliance. And part of that, in addition to uh, building systems upgrades on the inside of the building um, is to improve the envelope where we can and the, the, the windows are the obvious target for that. So where we have uh, metal framed single glazed units, um, which are quite leaky and drafty, we will be installing thermally broken metal framed units with uh, insulated glazing or double glazing inside them. Going back to the issue of um, visibility from the public way, um, this section diagram illustrates that from the other side of the sidewalk in 75th Street. The, the rotunda itself is, is clearly visible and you can see that in all the photographs here. But by virtue of about a 20 foot setback at the uh, second floor, um, which is a playground terrace for the um, nursery school there, the windows on this facade, on this elevation here are not visible from 75th Street. And again, the photos, whether taken directly in front or obliquely looking from either end of the block bear that out. Another portion of the work we're doing here is to improve accessibility in the building. Um, one of the issues that we have found uh, looking at this facade in particular is the operation of the windows. Um, at the moment, there's a fixed light at the top. There's an awning, an outward opening awning and an inward opening hopper. And the actual lever to operate this window is above what is deemed to be an accessible, reachable height at the moment. The other issue is that the doors here in the, in the current facade um, are slightly too narrow to be accessible as well. And finally, there is a classroom behind these windows here and these yellow lines that are drawn on the um, existing elevation indicate where there's partitions between classrooms behind. This classroom does not have direct access to the terrace at the moment. So our proposal 
um, and one of the reasons we're, we're bringing it in front of you is we would like to change the operation of the windows. Uh, we're still retaining the general um, intent of awnings and fixed lights, but whereas previously there, um, there was a separate fixed and the hopper level, we would like to combine the two so that the um, operation of that can be done at a lower level um, within accessible reach. We would like to widen the doors um, Ex with, the, with the exception of where we are widening the doors by a matter of about three inches, we are retaining the same alignment of mullions to align with the existing stone paneling up above. There's a slight adjustment which is going to be necessary around these doors. And finally, we would like to introduce um, another door here to provide direct access from the classroom behind these windows to, to the playground terrace. Um, so I'll just jump into a little bit more detail here. Here we can see the existing windows um slightly modified and uh, here we have a comparison between the existing and the proposed and so by virtue of the fact that we're going from um you know windows um single glazed windows that are not in thermally broken frames um to you know high performance modern windows of course there is an increase in the overall sort of framing widths um and there is a slight loss of like the clear glazed area, which we have analyzed here. And depending on the width of the actual window itself, that, that loss would be between 9.5 to 12% of the actual glazed area of the units. So um, LPC typically has a guideline whereby if you can keep the loss of glazing to within 10%, they would, they would typically review this at staff level. Um, uh, we have uh, mitigated this as best we can, but in the case of these windows on this level, it's not entirely possible. You can see here the red dashed outline overlays the framing of the existing windows onto the proposed. Another element is, you know, we have introduced, you know, um, we wanted to keep the, the overall configuration of the framing the same, um, with the same proportions as existing. Um, but as I've mentioned before, we have adjusted the operation of the windows to combine two operable units into one. Um, you can see here, um, you know, whereby there used to be six inches of spandrel or framing between glazed units that has increased slightly to uh, six and one eighth of an inch typically. And you can see also that whereby, you know, there used to be one or two inches between the horizontal members that has increased slightly to one in the case of a uh, mountain at this level, but four inches where there's a separation between a fixed light and a glazed light. The other thing that we've endeavored to do um, as much as possible is to keep the face of the glazing in the same plane with respect to the rest of the um, facade. So this, this, this setback dimension here on these windows at this level is, is retained. We're also replacing the windows at the rotunda. Um, a lot of the issues here are very similar to those that we just walked through on the second floor below. Um, again, it's a, uh, effectively a strip window system. Um, here we have fixed lights interspersed with the configuration of fixed awnings and hoppers. Um, we're gonna keep the same fixed operable rhythm, um, except as done on the floor below, we're consolidating two of the, two of the units or two of the operable lights into one single awning. Um, in the fixed lights, we were actually able to increase the extent of clear glazed area with the system that we have selected for this project. Um, again, you can see the red dashed outline of the existing framing overlaid on the proposed. Um, in this case, the face of the framing and glazing by virtue of needing to fit a wider overall frame um, that accommodates the double glazing and the thermal break and all the rest of it has sort of pushed the face of the glazing about an inch further out towards the facade but in, in proportion in general we believe that is something that would be negligibly, negligibly noticeable especially from the street down below and um, on the operable portions of the windows in the rotunda um, the situation is very much the same as, as explained on previous slides. So I think that concludes um, our presentation. I will. Do you want us to have, keep the presentation up for no. reference? I think it'd be a good idea to keep it up for reference.
Um, we thank you for a full and excellent presentation, clear presentation. And uh, we will see if uh, anybody from the public has a comment or a question. It's in Saida's hands to uh, see if there's anybody out there. If you're a member of the public and you would like to speak, you can raise your virtual hand by going to the bottom of your screen and selecting raise hand from the reactions button. No raise hands, David. Let's go to the committee and I guess let's take it in alphabetical order of who's ever here. Okay, Start Elizabeth, confirm unmuting. Uh, yes, I have, uh, which may sound a, a very odd question, but you're putting storefronts uh, on this building. Are you putting, are they actual storefronts in front of stores or are they just storefronts? Um, I think I was using the word, maybe I should change it to curtain wall. Um, the, it's just a glazing system that encloses that outdoor space so that we have an indoor space inside of it, which is a gathering space, lobby and lounge area. So it's just an extension of the public space on the ground floor. There will be no stores. This is a single use building. Uh, that's what it looked like, but they were referred to as storefronts and most of the storefronts I've seen are in front of stores. Um, Uh, I I think uh, I prefer the fencing. Um, but I think I could, and I'm not so sure I like the idea of something that looks like a storefront, but just glazing to get into that seems to me fine. And I think the, the new windows, which are, uh, up higher um, are reasonably respectful of the uh, existing, and I think I could live with that too. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gail, confirm unmuting. Saida, and thank you for an excellent presentation. I just have a couple of questions. Um, given the fact that the windows will be somewhat larger, that there will be uh, less glazing in certain cases. How will that impact the amount of light that will uh, basically come out uh, to the street? Will that have any significant uh, impact at all? On the on the upper floors or on the, the upper lower floors. Floor? On the upper floors. I, 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 by, by virtue of the fact that the windows are continuous arranged in continuous strips i think the impact will be minimal compared to what's there today and then on the ground floor by uh, the change of design and the opening to be able to use it and i do understand for programmatic means how does that impact lighting also on the street when you say soft yeah. uh, versus what you have now could you yeah that's a great question thank you um the, actually, the um, courtyard space is lit today by a series of, of not so uh, friendly um, lights, down lights, because it's required for a certain amount of foot candles of light for the security cameras that are there. You can imagine that a space like this, there, there, there's, there have been security cameras and Temple Israel feels that they need to keep that space lit at night in order um, just to for, for the appearances and as well for the security cameras to see what's going on on. So actually, I would contend that our lighting will be more sensitive to being an interior space. It won't be blasting light. This is low level lighting that we um, can control um, the variability of it so that it can have a setting at nighttime, which is much lower as compared to if they're having an event. But even having an event, it, this is not, you know, it, it's not like bright, bright lighting that, you know, um, it's just nice public lobby type of space lighting. So I don't think it will have a negative impact. Thank you. And the other question that I had uh, had to do with signage. I recognize that Temple uh, Israel will be the same size sign. You also adjacent on the facade have the street address, but under it, you also have Temple Israel. And I was wondering 
as to why it was necessary when the signage looks as if it's fairly close to have yeah. Temple Israel both underneath the street address as well as on the upper facade. Yeah, th thank you for that question. Um, we It has been conveyed to us that, um, that there is still confusion sometimes for people coming to Temple Israel, that they're at the right place, despite the fact that this is you know, the only institutional building on the block. Um, the fact that, first of all, the Temple Israel um, pin mounted letters that you're noting up at the top on the limestone facade cannot mm -hmm. be cannot be lit because of zoning restrictions. So no one is really going to see it if they're coming at a time when it's not well lit, well lit during the daytime or during dusk. And also a pedestrian coming obliquely down the street may not see that signage either. So um, our client felt quite strongly that they needed something at the pedestrian's eye level to indicate that this is indeed Temple Israel. Thank you. Those are my questions. Michelle? Thank you very much. And thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, can you describe to, for me in a little more detail what you meant when you said you're pulling <clears throat> the lower area, you're pulling it forward, you said, um, and you showed the property line. Um, what are you putting pulling forward? Because if you go around the rotunda, you are attempting to give more lobby interior space, right? So that tells me that you're pulling the existing, what are the existing door openings further into the street. And yet when you showed the door opening, it looked as though you, you well, you use the word recessed. So I'm sort of confused as to what's happening down on the bottom. Can you just yeah. go yeah. over that? I'm happy to. I'm sorry if there was confusion. Steve, could you advance to the existing full ground floor plan? And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll go through it again, again, and please stop me if I'm not being clear. So right now, just inside of the property line is the fence and gate there that Steve is pointing to. And then you walk through the courtyard until you get to the existing vestibule. There's one set of doors, then you're in a vestibule, then you're in another set of doors, and then you're fully inside. And all of that uh, space with the radial pattern is a terrazzo floor. So you're inside the building at that point, you go all the way around past the elevators, and then you come back out through a set of secondary doors. So that's the way it exists today. And it may be that I was just using my, my prepositions wrong when I described the proposal, which we'll go to now. So in the proposal, the existing vestibule goes away and we create a new vestibule which is set back one foot, eight inches from the property line. And that's continuous across the entire facade. That that's what we call storefront is a continuous facade, end to end, one foot, six inches back. And then there's a series of doors that let you into the vestibule, the main vestibule and the service vestibule. Is that more clear? Yeah, it is. So. And the only thing that might come past the property line is when those doors get open, they swing out. And that's the only thing that's past the property line. Everything else is behind the property line. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, can you also tell me that you have elevators? Uh, where do they go? You They go into the round rotunda, which is what? Classrooms? Yeah, it's offices and classrooms. Now, on that facade you're changing the size of the windows how is that work out since it's circular the 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 window openings are not changing in size what changes is the thickness of the framing and so all of the framing where it aligns the center line of the framing stays on the center line of the existing framing and it lines up with um, stone panel joints in the rotunda facade itself so what happens is the framing just gets minimally larger by virtue of the fact that it needs to be thermally broken and energy efficient but the actual glazing is the same size that exists now? It's ever so slightly smaller because the framing gets a little bit thicker. So 
depending on the window, the framing takes up about somewhere, depending on the window, um, six to 12% of the glass area. But the actual opening, the edges of the frame remain the same. We're not changing any of the op openings in the stone facade. What's the framing made out of? The current one is, um, it's a steel frame system and we're putting in an aluminum frame system. Uh, uh, bronze colored or? It, it'll be colored white, just as the existing is colored white. It'll be coated. Uh -huh. So the number of openings isn't changing. Not at all. But, but when you look at it, you will be seeing, to the eye, you will be seeing more frame than glass, correct? You will be seeing a little bit more frame today, yes, than you do. Um, a little bit more framing from the proposal than you do today. And that's maybe, a, oh, I can't zoom in. What we try to do here is you can, uh, if you can make out the um, faint red dashed line yeah, uh -huh. around the outside, that shows you the line of the existing framing. So you can see in some areas that the new framing comes in a little bit further than the existing framing. So when you say, when you say you lose six to 12% of the glass, what is that in inches? Um, okay, so on, on the sides, you lose about an eighth of an inch on the framing down the sides of these units. And at the top here, you lose, you lose two inches at the top. You lose three inches in this member here. But this member here is actually one inch narrower than the existing by virtue of the fact that we've combined two openings into one. So horizontally, you're losing <clears throat> something, practically nothing. But Vertically, you're, you're losing about four inches. Is that correct? Five inches? Did I calculate that right? Um, <clears throat> yeah, about four, four inches. Yeah. Four to five inches, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I, I just have some, some note. Oh, the horizontal louver that goes across the whole building between the two floors. What is that made out of? That will be painted metal as well, just like the system, the storefront system. So it'll look like it's a part of the storefront system. So it's black or it's showing like bronze here. Is that yes. what it is? All of this is intended to be a dark bronze color. And so will the louver. Correct. And the doors, <clears throat> like a lighter bronze appearance. The doors itself, no, will will be the same dark bronze. But the interplayer, uh, the the, the inter uh, spandrel. Yeah, the film, lighter. the film that's between the glazing. No, the coloring will probably be very similar, but because it's between two pieces mm. of glass, there might be a small change in the way that you see it. But we we want it to be as as sort of um, sympathetic as possible, as much as possible, the same as the dark bronze coating. It's just that you're trying to replicate two things that are different materials. Two more questions. Where is the Picasso granite going? Is that a baseboard granite? Correct. That's at the water course. Uh, Steve is going to point to it okay, here. I see. Yep. Okay. And that's all straight across. Yep. Okay. Then you go to what you refer to as a bulletin board, which I assume is uh, a, a lit um, enclosed box of some kind, maybe right. with a frame, but with a glass front. Is that what that is? And that'll be operable in from inside with LED lighting. Is that what you're proposing? Um, so essentially, um, the it's actually using the storefront mm. system glazing. It's just sort of incorporated into the storefront itself. So it will be a, a hinged and will in-swing. The bulletin board itself will in-swing into the building for access so that you can pin things up and, and the like. Um, Steve, I'm not sure if we have specified exactly on the inside what the lighting condition is, have we? On the interior of the building or, and, or for at the, the bulletin at the, board? At the bulletin board. You said pin swing. Does that mean in you're swing. pinning in, letters in there? You're not doing? In swing, not, not no, pin No, no, I realize the door is gonna bring the back panel inside so that a message could be placed on it and from what you described it sounds like the message will be like pinned letters as opposed to led lit like an led lit oh, panel. 
No, that's what I mean. Which is it? Oh no, we're not we're not doing LED lit panel. Okay. This is so it'll be like analog. pinned in letters like a, on like a felt back or whatever whatever the uh, material. Actually, no, it's it, we're imagining it's a cork material like a linoleum, you know, a cork that you can actually oh. pin pin things on. It's not like the thing where you place little letters onto felt. It's actually something where we can take we can design you know, signage. Oh, a flyer of some kind. You Correct. Mean. You, yes. Oh, yeah. I get Flyers, it. Flyers, okay. posters. Yep. How big is that? What's the width of that, Steve? Oh, it's about a foot and a half wide. And high? Uh, it's the same height as the rest of the glazing. So, about um, eight feet. yeah, that part, the glazing is over eight feet, eight yep. feet ten. Let's see if I can get oh, to that. Oh, so it's, can you show me where that'll be placed? So it's about an eight foot. There you go. Panel. <laughs> yep. Okay, and so you will have poster type things, you know, notices yep. on the entire height and width of that. Uh, yes, you I mean, about the lighting yet? No, there. It, well, we're not gonna. It's not gonna be like LED lit. Um, we're not sure about whether we'll need more lighting on the inside of that. Um, that hasn't been determined yet we haven't specified the actual because you think it. you're gonna you'll have enough of it on the outside we may yeah uh but yet you said you only had one tiny little fixture on the outside we have a we have a strip led fixture um i it really is a detail that we haven't figured out but we're happy to come back to you with an answer on that about whether there will be lighting on the inside um of that box but but it would be of interest to me anyway to know what the lighting will be on the outside how how bright it would be i have to say i mean i understand what you're doing i certainly understand the security priorities um it basically it looks like a good idea but i am a little i'm a little sort of disturbed about the commercial look of uh this in quote storefront um so that's a little bothersome to me. Um, uh, you know, I have to just sort of think about that a little bit. Uh, knowing the lighting would be helpful. So if you can share what you're thinking about at this moment, that would be helpful in clarifying a vision. Um, and those are my comments. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Sarah, yeah. confirm and muting. I have no question. Thank you. And Anthony, confirm and muting. Uh, hi. I um, it, uh, a, a wonderful presentation as usual. Um, truly, uh, I'm. My son was a student at uh, the Temple Israel, Israel Nursery School just before they put the fence up, and the fence made me really sad. Um, I, I thought that the, that the way that the, the, the sanctuary was expressed and sort of then burst through in its own way, burst through the top of the building and, um, and the kind of um, deep shadow that actually never seemed threatening to me um, until I looked at the pictures just now. But anyway, as a, as a parent, uh, but um, <clears throat> Given the security reasons for putting up the fence in the first place, this is absolutely positively an improvement. Um, and uh, I think that it's, it is probably absolutely the correct personality for this kind of um, architectural personality for, for what you're trying to do. Um, the, the, I have one tiny question. Uh, which is that you appear to be changing the, and then a comment, um, you appear to be changing the font of the Temple Israel. And is, I was just wondering what the logic was behind that. Although again, I think I prefer the proposed. It, uh, great eye <laughs> that you picked up on that. Um, we, it's true that we're going, from Steve, I'm correct though it's a it's a it's a very light serifed font now, mm -hmm. and we're taking the serifs off, which we actually think is both appropriate to the era of the original building in a sans serif font, but also like a a tiny bit more contemporary 
as well. So it sort of does both of those things and we think it's more appropriate than a serif font, so. Yeah, I, I, I think you're probably right. Although um, a funny thing about the early 60s is that there were lots of um, sort of uh, typefaces with fonts used for this kind of application that always, that seems in retrospect to have been odd given um, how great this, uh, the sans serif uh, fonts look. And, but the question, that, uh, the comment that I have is that you're absolutely right to put the name of the building uh, as well as the address at more or less at eye level. Um, I, if I didn't know that the, that the pin, pin mount letters were there, I would never have, um, uh, I probably never noticed them in, you know, two years of going there every day. So um, if it's above eye level, you just don't see it. Yep. And, uh, and I think that the rest of it, the, the, the windows up above and providing a door for the third classroom uh, is uh, a big improvement and certainly functionally a huge improvement. Mm -hmm. So thank you. It's a wonderful presentation. I can support this. Thank you. Thank you. Marco, confirm yeah. unmuting. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, in general terms, I support the application. I think um, what you try to do is uh, the function follow the form because now it's more functional. It's, it, it works in different direction. I think it's, it's a very good and a smart idea in that direction. Uh, I think um, the that you need the programmatical function, the functionality of the space and the security, it makes a lot of sense what you are proposing. Definitely, I, I perceive, even that I don't like much, but it's better than you have these fans. It looks more like a jail rather to be a temple. I think it makes a lot of, it, it is a huge improvement what you did. Definitely, I agree with, the, with, the, with that proposal. Uh, I am going to support the application. However, I would like to make some comments, even though that, that is not part of the, this process, is about the energy efficiency. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, as a part of my decision, but I had to comment in that part since uh, and the, Mr. Uh, Stephen uh, claims uh, something that I disagree. Uh, first of all, by the code, uh, if it's not an individual landmark, it must be in compliance with the code. And I'm very happy that you try to comply with that. Or unless if it's this property registered in New York State Register of Historical Districts, if it's, if it's that, yes, so you cannot be in compliance. If it's, if it's not, so you must be in compliance. So um, the other point is your, your, your windows, you reduce the glazing and then you put another uh, double glaze. That's basically what it is. But the steel is, is almost nothing. Uh, one glass and two glass, there is not much difference at all. It's equal. And then you increase the framing, and the framing you increase thermal breach. When you in, in, increase thermal breach, the, the windows become even worse. So uh, I think my, my point of view in the direction I disagree, but that is not in the way that I make my assessment in this case. My assessment is what you presented to us. I think it's reasonable what you did. It's, I think there's a lot of improvement that in, in this application, and this is what I approve. I, I support your, your, your ideas. Thank you. Thank you. Kimberly, confirm and muting. Hi, thanks, Sahida. Um, just to reiterate what you know, my colleagues have said, this is an excellent presentation and thank you so much. Um, initially, my concerns related to the reflectiveness of the glass, but that was answered in uh, Gail's line of questioning so I can support this application. David? Okay, uh, well, listening to everybody's comments, uh, I think there are just a couple of items I'd like to touch on. Uh, number one, I do think that, uh, as has been pointed out, functionally, and I also believe aesthetically, you've made very, very good judgments. 
uh, and we're looking at uh, a much better building. Uh, from an energy point of view, you clearly have improved it, even if you're not always, if you're not perfectly uh, at the up to code. Uh, so I think you've made the effort, and I think we need to applaud that. Uh, <clears throat> I think that the term storefront is a term of art that architects tend to use, maybe a little too loosely. Fact of the matter is that what you have is a glazing system, as you pointed out, and that glazing system I think is very appropriate for this building. Uh, and I also think that the transparency that you've created in some sense uh, echoes the courtyard that used to be there uh, and the sense of the rotunda going through. Uh, and I think uh, during the day, it'll be a little more subtle at night. Uh, it'll be a little less subtle, but I actually think uh, that's part of the uh, benefits uh, of what you've done. So if there is an event there and there is transparency and the synagogue is part of the community, uh, I think the transparency is a really good thing. Uh, on balance, I think uh, it's extremely well done. It certainly has my support. Uh, and I hope that uh, with all of the discussion that's gone on, that some of the reservations that people have uh, perhaps have gone by the wayside. I would also say that not everything an architect, not everything that uh, an architect does technically uh, is always available at this stage of the game. And uh, I think that uh, with respect to the lighting, uh, the uh, type of lighting that you're proposing, namely uh, washing down in front of the windows uh, will be a soft light on the sidewalk. I think that'll be fine. Uh, if you need to supplement the lighting for the bulletin board, uh, I can't imagine you're doing something that would have the brightness uh, of, a, um, of an LED uh, screen. So I think that to some extent, uh, even where there are reservations, uh, we have to have faith given the quality of the presentation today uh, that you will do the right thing uh, in following it through. I think the last thing we wanna ask you to do is come back uh, when you have a date with landmarks, uh, not with this quality, kind of a quality presentation. So, <clears throat> with that said, I hope that uh, somebody is going to make a resolution, which will be a resolution to approve as presented. Considering all the yes. good comments. Thank you, Marco. Yes, I would like to support. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I had to put the motion or support your motion. Well, I didn't make a motion. I asked. Oh, for okay. One. I would like to put the motion. The motion is approved as presented. Thank you. Is anybody can second? Do we have a second? I can't can't believe all of the quietude tonight. I'll second it. Let's go yeah. to the, the. We have a second, so let's vote. Saida, if you would please call the roll. Here. Said, I can't hear anything. Are you calling the roll? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, one second while yes. I get everyone unmuted. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes. Okay. Gail? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Oh, I missed Michelle. Sorry, Michelle. One second. Michelle? I, I, yes. I just want to say, David, there were a lot of seconds up. I think you couldn't see them on your screen. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, Anthony? Yes. Okay, David? Yes. Marco? Yes, thank you. Thank you. And Kimberly? Yes. Oh, 
So thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Barb Linda Bell. Thank you. And, uh, thanks to the committee. And uh, we'll now go on to the next application, which is 18 East 68th Street. Stephen V. Jacobs Group PC, a Beaux-Arts style building designed by Cass Gilbert and erected 1904-1905. Application is for installation of two ornamental lion figures at the front entry stoop and installation of a cast iron gate at the front stoop to match the existing wrought iron fencing at the front area way. So is uh, someone here from the Jacobs Group? Uh, yes, Carlos? Uh, I am here. Uh, it should also be uh, Alec Jacobs. Mm -hmm. uh, Irina Benfield. And Alfred Weiss. All unmuted. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm Alexander Jacobs with the Stephen Jacobs Group. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. So let me, uh, let me share my screen here. Um, hold on. Okay, so um, the the building is uh, eighteen East Sixty Eighth Street. It's uh, it's Cass Gilbert Building, uh, located on the uh, south side of East Sixty Eighth Street between Park Avenue and Madison Avenue. Um, it was originally um, uh, it, it was uh, one second. Um, it was originally the Sloan Mansion designed. It was built around nineteen oh five. Uh, and it was a single family residence. Uh, our client, uh, Alex Roft, has uh, been spent the last 10 years. He's uh, restored the building to its original condition, including replacing the windows, uh, the mansard roofing, uh, the completely gutted the interior and restoring it to its, its, its former glory. Um, the, uh, everything was approved by Landmarks. He's almost complete, but uh, the, the owner had one other, one or two other smaller uh, things that he wanted to do in front of the building uh, to kind of what he feels would be, would complete the building. Let's see. Okay, so uh, what you're looking at is the front of the building. This was, a, this was maybe a year or two ago uh, uh, when construction was still underway. It, it's now complete. I'll, I'll go to a more recent picture of the building, the front of the building. There it is. So uh, the, the ownership has two requests. Um, one, if you see the top of the, um, the top of the, um, there's two um, balustrades or, or entrance ways in the beginning uh, that originally had urns on them. And I can have, uh, have an original uh, drawing of the building that kind of shows the urns where they were initially. Uh, ownership would kind of uh, would like to put lions on top of these instead of the urns. There is he feels there's something missing with the ornamentation, uh, and he wants to kind of bring that back because it feels like there's something missing from it. So what he re would like to do is restore lions. There's a uh, there's a precedent for uh, for lions. There's actually lion ornamentation in the building. If we can uh, if I can find the, uh, the photographs here of the. Uh... <laughs> Uh, there are some there is there we have restored some some line ornamentation within the building this is what he's proposing to put in front of the building which are brass ornamentation and that that's how it would look as installed uh, he's also he also wants to put fencing in front of the stoop uh, there's been a problem lately with with um, piece people pretty much camping out having lunch and smoking cigarettes uh, it's proximity to Central Park it causes a lot of people. So there's constantly people in front of them. So he wants to restore a gate similar to exactly what was, uh, is currently there uh, on the areaway. He's actually restored some of the airway fencing uh, gate to, to match what was originally there. Um, and we have a few photos of, you know, typical ornamentation for lions and gates that are, you know, frequent the neighborhood, uh, whether they're original to the building or with landmarks approval or not without landmarks approval. Um, uh, we can't really ascertain, but it, there's a, there, there's a history of these this kind of ornamentation in the neighborhood and of buildings of this era. So 
So the fencing, let me, uh, let me find the, so the fencing would be, this is the fencing they're planning to install, which would match the, the fencing of the, uh, of what, what's already on the upper facade of the building and they're along the areaway. Oh, I have a better image of that. That's not that. That's other properties with fencing, with similar fencing on stoops. And uh, that's that's currently the facade with, with the line. Uh, that's kind of the presentation. That's kind of the, that, that's the intent of what the owner wants to do. So, <clears throat> can you give us the size of the lions and give us the uh, image again so we can sure. digest it? Sure. So there's there's the lions. It's about three feet in height, which is almost which ap approximates what we think the urn was when when it was when it was originally there. If I'll, I'll scroll back to that kind of. It's hard to see these images of what, with urns that were there. That's from the original Cass Gilbert drawings. And I'll give you this for the scale. Okay, that's helpful. And as far as the gate goes, it's. Can you just show us that one more time? So we sure. So this is the actually this this gate here we actually replaced. It was a simple straight gate, and then part as part of the previous restoration of the building, we replaced the uh, the gate to the areaway with uh, with a gate that matched uh, matched the existing areaway grading. And the, what we're proposing is. Sorry, there. Okay, so it's matching the uh, area way. Okay. Right. Just wanted to make sure that I understood it and everybody else understood it. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, we will go to the public. Saida, please see if there's anybody who has a question or a comment. Uh, just as a reminder to members of the public, if you wish to comment, you can go to the reactions button at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand. There are no raised hands, David. Excuse me? There are no raised hands. No raised hands. Okay, we'll go to the committee, but this time we'll go backwards. We'll start with Marco. Marco, confirm unmuting. Thank you, lady. Okay, um, I think the fence makes a lot of sense because yeah, my intent, the continuity of the existing fence, I think is also in the district maintain this kind of, uh, this type of fencing and the locations on the stoop. The lions, unless, he, uh, let me ask a question to the applicant. The lions you said that was original in that place? No, no, they're not original. They're, oh, originally, oh, there were urns there. At least that's what the original, um, the drawings show. Okay. So but, there was some kind of ornamentation up there at one point in time, according to the original drawings. So, you know, we want to restore the ornamentation. They don't necessarily want to put urns back because the, the I think they were probably a lot more in the neighborhood as well, but these, they wound up collecting garbage. So they, they, they want to, they think the building is kind of like uh, missing something without the ornamentation that it looks like it was always designed to have, but they, they you know, urns is not the, what the, how they want to go. I agree that some, it, it, it needs uh, something. That's I'm a hundred percent agree with you. Uh, but the lion, uh, I'm not sure, honestly. Thank you. Well, yeah, there are a couple. There are a couple. So we had a few examples of you know I don't know if they're appropriate or not appropriate of other lions throughout the neighborhood. It seemed to be popular, at, you know, at least in some juncture. So thank you so much for this. Thank you. Thank you. While while we're on the topic of the lions, you indicated that. There was lion's ornamentation in the building. Yeah, uh, hold on. Let me see if I can share that with you. Um, as long as you're making the case, let's make the case. You're absolutely correct. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can. Uh... Something here. Hold on a second. Yeah. 
Give me a moment, please. Oh, so you able to share this? Send this to me. You want one? Uh, yeah, I sent it to you. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. I, I, actually, maybe you can have him share it, and he can uh, post it up. Okay. It's going to take a while. We can continue with uh, the comments. We can go to Anthony. Anthony, confirm unmuting. Um. Hi. Um. I have to agree with Marco that I am more than a little dubious about the lions. Um, but I also have some questions. Um, and the first question is, where is the fence relative to the property line? Uh, the, the fence kind of sits on the first step. So it's behind the property well, line. Is it behind the property line? Is the property line at the stoop or is the property line at the building face? I think the property lines at the building fence, but it would kind of be in line there. No, no, building face. The building face. Because uh, frequently on the Upper East Side, the stoops extend beyond the property line. Yeah, it could extend beyond the property line. I think you're right. I think it actually is the property line is the building in this case. Which is to say that the fence will be on the pro will be in what is technically the public way. Correct, but it's but it's on their stoop. Yes. Well, I know it's there, Stu, but um, <laughs> OK. And um, I got that question. And then um, this is sort of what is the fencing material, both of the old part that was it, Did you replace the whole fence and replace to match or did you or is some of the old fence or some of the fence that's already there, the old fence and some and then are they all, is it all going to be the same material? Is it different material? How are you? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's run iron. It's going to be the same material. The only thing we, we replaced was uh, uh, that areaway gate was the, uh, was, the, um, was the gate itself. So the fencing itself, there was like a three foot wide gate that we replicated right. to match it. We've also done some wrought iron work in the back to match what was there as well. So we had some railings as well, but that, uh, that was all part of proved as part of landmarks. Okay, and if, if you look I, up top, you can see that yeah. the, you know it, it's kind of the same design, same the original in, design. In your so presentation, it, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, if you if you look at the top, if you look at the, up, the upper balcony mm -hmm. up there, you can see that that the same wrought iron uh, type of design is used up top. That that's the same thing we would be replicating. Um, I I took a quick look at the. Um, 1939-1940 tax photo, and that seems to indicate, it's not perfectly clear, of course, nothing ever is, um, it seems to indicate that whatever was there in the drawing was not there uh, by 1939-40, just as a, a kind of point of, uh, point of reference. Um, yeah, in the forties, this building had been converted back to a multiple dwelling. It was originally built as a single family. So, you know, in the forties, they had cut this up and into like, you know, several apartments on the inside and then destroyed some of the interiors. Uh, we've, uh, where we're, we've have restored it back to its single family, single family use that I don't know what has, that has to do with the urns or not, but you know, I don't know if the urns lasted that long, if they were even there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think, at this point, that's uh, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, David, we have a raised hand from Friends of the Upper East Side. You can confirm the muting. Let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's hear the comment. Hi, David. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, this is Laura Sikking from Friends of the Upper East Side. I do have a question that 
um, it seems like you're proposing to install just two lions. That's correct, because there is a, a, a third pole to the other side of the building that the original drawing shows that there was an urn. And I just want to make sure that there are two and not three lions being proposed. Yeah, I, yes, we, we, we realize there's another pedestal off to the, off to the uh, side of the property. Uh, but um, they don't want to put in a, they're not interested in putting a line there. It will probably distract from the entrance, we think. Thank you. Okay. Continue with the committee. Sarah? Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. And um, I don't have a question about the fence, but I wanted to ask David, David, if the fence is not on the property line, do we consider that today? Does it come back for revocable consent or how does that work? Our mission is to make a judgment with respect to uh, whether it's appropriate and whether it's contextual and uh, technical issues like, uh, irre like a revocable consent uh, is something that uh, is beyond uh, what we uh, rule on. Uh, so uh, if they do not have a revocable consent and they have to get one, uh, then it becomes uh, their problem to do that. Uh, but right now, all we're doing is ruling on whether we approve the fence from the point of view of, is it appropriate to the building? Is it appropriate to the neighborhood? And if so, then we'll vote yes, and if not, then we'll vote no. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Michelle? Thank you. Firstly, can you please put up, we're looking at like a half a slide. Can you just put up the front of the building, you know, <clears throat> your proposed? Can you get that hold on, on the screen? See. Yeah, hold on a second. Let me uh, see why it's not sharing the... Uh... So if, thank you, if this building were to have urns, how high would the urn be? I'm asking because what's the realistic concern that somebody would reach up that high and throw refuse in it? I think it would probably be about the same three foot above it is, three foot above. The, uh, so if you're adding three to what you have there, what do you, what's the total height? It depends. Uh, from, from the street, probably maybe seven feet. From the stoop, oh. maybe not that high. Okay. But if the stoop had a fence on its first step, a person couldn't get up on that first step and couldn't reach that urn if it's seven feet high. So the concern about it gathering trash is not as real a concern in my mind. Um, and so I would rather talk about the aesthetics of it. The little decorations that are on the front of the columns, what are those? Are they look, well, they look like lions to me, but I can't really see them. I see a zoom in here. On the yeah. pillars. Okay. Yeah, what are those? Uh, yeah, that, that's just a little decoration. It's, I don't think they're a Yeah, what is it? I don't see don't it just looks like an possibly an egg and dart kind of motif. I don't know. Oh, okay. So it's got I, nothing. It, so it has nothing to do with anything that you're proposing. And it's not a design that repeats anywhere on the proposed fencing. No. Has nothing to do with anything. But I assume it's original to those columns. Yes. Okay. My opinion, know. I mean, you haven't really described. <clears throat> Uh, what the lions would be made of, what kind of a lion it would be. The lion you showed looks like a, little, a, a puny lion to me. So I'm not so thrilled with the, I don't know that it's dimension so much as it is the fullness of the sculpture. I would prefer to see urns, that, that's my personal opinion. But other than that, I have no problem uh, with the, um, the new fence and it being on the first step. And while I ordinarily 
uh, oppose ir- uh, revocable consents when they are coming past the building line, I have never requested that a structure be removed back to the building line once it has been there. So I won't oppose that here. It's there. It is what it is. Um, yeah, you don't have to scroll anymore for my purposes. My eyes okay. are rolling. But I'm looking, right. I mean, these lions, I don't know. I mean, you've had a dimension there of like 13 and a half inches in the width and maybe three feet up. But to me, as you have sketched them, they look a little puny. I would be more comfortable agreeing to lions if I actually saw the sculpture, not oh, the sketches of the sculpture. So for the purposes of today's discussion, I would rather see urns. Okay. Okay. This is the uh, the actual lion itself. That's actually the bronze lion. They, they and it's all bronze. Yes. So this is thirty three inches high, and is this the one that's thirteen and a half inches, or was that just the sketch? Where the sketch width, was. Width. The width. The width. Yeah, that's the width. That is the width. So that is the width. So it's three yeah. feet by thirteen and a half. Yeah. All right. I'm not. I'm not frantic either way, but those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, Gail, confirm and muting. Michelle actually asked my questions. Um, right now, I lean toward preferring the urns because I think they're a little more graceful and certainly go back to the original design. I have absolutely no problems with the fence on the first step. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, confirm and muting. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I I think from pure uh, appropriateness, probably urns would be better. But I think, uh, and this is just my personal opinion, because members of my family have actually owned lions, and I've cuddled lions, and I love lions. <laughs> Um, and this is not a style of architecture that's restrained and laid back. Uh, it takes two things like, uh, lions, uh, and, uh, I will s- support this. I would prefer that they were, uh, carved limestone than bronze. I think that that would be preferable to the architecture, uh, but I, I would be very happy to see some lions there. Thank you. Uh, Kimberly. Thank you, Saida. Um, I should start by saying that my office is located in a Cass Gilbert building, so I'm more familiar with this architect compared to some of the others that have been brought before this committee. Um, to my knowledge, there are no lions on the New York Life Building, but that doesn't mean that this is you know, inappropriate just on that. I would say that based on the other contextual examples that you showed in this presentation, those other lions are made of some sort of a ceramic and this is bronze. And I think that is where I struggle with this a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this specific application, but I'm sure David will educate me. <laughs> David? All I can do is look at it like everybody else. And I have no special educational uh, insights for you. Uh, I would only say that I'm um, not in love with putting the fence across, but uh, uh, I can reluctantly go along with it. I am not uh, in love with the lions that are proposed, uh, but uh, bronze is certainly um, you know, it's a, a traditional material, it's a grand material, uh, and uh, uh, it's certainly a traditional material. So again, uh, I would sort of reluctantly go along with it. Uh, I am not uh, strongly in favor of what we're looking at, uh, but I don't see any reason to say no to it. Uh, and therefore, I would vote for it and go f- let the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, add their wisdom to it. 
So with that, uh, I think we need a resolution. Um, it would be good to know whether we have to split this. Uh, can I just get a straw vote on how many people uh, are strongly opposed to the Lions? You can raise your hands, oh. your virtual hands. Well, it looks like just Anthony is opposed. Oh, Marco, Michelle also. Well, we have how many voting people? One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. Seven with Kimberly. With Kimberly. Um, and I think we think we should take it as one uh, as one resolution. Mm -hmm. So uh, I need a resolution to approve. I'll make the resolution to approve, and I need a second. We have a second from Gail. Thank you. So please call the roll, and we'll call it in reverse order. Okay, Marco. I'm going to pass. Okay. Uh, David? I'm last. Whatever your order, I'm last. Anthony? No. Sarah? Yeah. Sarah? Hi, sorry, I lost your unmute and then- um, No problem. Now I'm unmuted, thank you. Um, I, uh, I will vote yes. Okay. Michelle? Yes. Gail? Yes. Elizabeth? Yes. Uh, Kimberly. Yes. Okay. Um, Marco, back to you. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. And David. Yes. Okay. Seven, Seven in favor, eight. one opposed. Okay. Thank you for the. Uh, presentation and thanks to the committee and uh, Anthony has uh, uh, agreed to uh, take the third application. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Anthony, all yours. Okay, great. Um, is there someone here from the applicant, someone from Oliver Cope? Yes, one moment. Rita? Rita Marks is here for Oliver Cope Architect. Great, welcome. Um, so you. you should go ahead and begin. One second, let me get the presentation. Okay. All right, good. We're going to start at the first page. So we're going to go to cover sheet A00. So keep, so you keep flipping down till you hit the top for us. Thank you. There you go. All right. Nope. First sheet again. Is this the one? That's us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 965 Fifth Avenue is a multi-story residential building just off the corner of Fifth Avenue and 78th Street on the Upper East Side. It was built in 1937 and the architect was Irving Morgan. The Landmarks Designation Report describes this building as classicizing modern style, which can be seen on the Fifth Avenue facade photo 
called West Elevation, image on the right. Our project proposal is focused on the rear facade seen on the photo on the left of the screen, that's the East Elevation. We're combining two apartments on the floor of 12 and the 12C apartment on the east has the original steel windows and terrace door and it's, fenestra it's this fenestration we want to replace. In addition, we propose the relocation, shifting of two existing masonry openings in the same east wall, replacing two double hung windows with two terrace doors, getting access to our central terrace. We're getting a lot of interference, Saida. Okay. Rita, are you moving anything on your computer? Or Nothing. You... Okay. Well, it seems to be fine now. Okay. Next panel. Look at the upper center image uh, called View B. That's the rear elevation, and that gives the clearest picture of the context we're working in. Uh, one Friday, second, Rita. Hold do you have a, maybe a headset that you can use? I don't have a headset, but I'll, you know what I'll do? I'll turn my phone off. Do you think that's the problem? It's possible. Um, you know what the problem is? Um, if I turn my phone off, I, that's how I'm getting my internet service. Okay. <laughs> now we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Can I continue? There is some interference, and so we're having trouble hearing you when you speak. Um, can you maybe mute your phone? Are you like calling in on your oh, phone? Is yes. that where you're getting nope. your audio? Let me, mute my, let me mute my phone. Okay. Um, do I know how to mute the phone? Um, are you using an iPhone? iPhone, how do you mute the iPhone? Okay, are you calling in for your audio? No, I'm on it, I'm, I'm using my internet service as a hotspot off my phone. Okay, that shouldn't be giving it any issues. And there's nothing covering your microphone on your computer? Nope. All right, well, we can hear you now, so let's try to... Okay, let's give it a whirl. So, uh oh, for a uh, So, center image, top is, the, is a clear view of the rear elevation. So, on Friday, we met over Zoom with landmarks, and in reviewing our request, we came to an agreement that maintaining the look of the historic windows and doors was best for the client, and landmarks and would, would be approved at staff level. So the only remaining thing that would bump us into a hearing with landmarks is a relocation of one of two masonry openings in the east facade. So if you look at the white box, the center photo called view B, that's our apartment 12C. And it's the first two openings, which are double hung windows we would like to replace with terrace doors. Next. Can you hear me? Yes, I moved it. Can you see? Thank the... you. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, we should be at um, very good. Why don't you stay here? So what we did is we walked the uh, path uh, west towards 78th Street and took a view of the what you can see uh, on the rear of the building as you turn from the east facade to the north facade. And you can see, if you look carefully, the variety of window styles and the um, movement of the windows that are not aligned and also the number of windows that were blanked up over the history of this building. And if we move to the next sheet, the next sheet. Do you see it? Which the next sheet would have red boxes on the, there you go. We also tagged in red, we stop here, tagged in red, the windows that had been changed over time. There you go. Each one of those represents the windows that were changed from the historic window, which is eight or six over one to largely casements. That's what we're finding. 
Next, please. So the one item that Landmark said uh, they would want to review in a public hearing is the window number 13. If we change it to a terrace door and shift it as we would like to one foot three inches south, that would trigger a hearing. They are happy to approve window 12 and its shift at a staff hearing and their position was the following. I said that number 12 has no alignment of a, of a, of a window above it. It was bricked up. So we were free to move that north or south, but because the window 13 has a window in the same plane on the floor above, they felt that alignment, if we moved that opening, would war warrant uh, the commissioners to consider it. Next, please. But our thinking about this was that if you consider the aggregate elevation and not just the windows above our floor, you'll see there's little, little rigor in the pattern and a shift of one masonry opening didn't seem to have enough impact in the elevation as a whole. So here we drew the north elevation and this we came to an agreement. We changed the existing windows uh, to uh, new windows with a mutton pattern and we're in agreement on this particular facade. Next sheet. This shows you on the lower drawing, three terrace doors. First one, number 12, we're, we're free to move. Number 13, you can see we seem to be moving it out of alignment with the window above. And the third one over to the left happens to be an existing terrace door, which we're keeping. And we're, we uh, agreed with landmarks, we'd maintain the six light horizontal mutton bar pattern as they're historic. And actually we really think they're, they're lovely. And all of these, by the way, are steel. The image on the bottom, those red boxes show you the shift we're asking for, for the existing window. Next, please. This is a Fifth Avenue side, there's no work. The last window, number 16 on the right, is not visible from the street. So Next, please. Uh, we're proposing steel windows to match as closely as possible to the historic windows and the color is desert tan. That's the uh, uh, landmark approved color for the entire building. Uh, good close-ups of the existing steel units that we're going to match. Uh, the windows currently have steel bent plate for sills, lower right-hand corner. We're going to replace that with a uh, cast stone. Over long term. Uh, brick will be copied. You'll see the top is great. We had a mock up made, got the formula down, so I, the, any brick repair will be hardly perceptible. Cast stone sill as compared to the steel sill and, uh, and uh, light and cold. Next, please. Uh, we drew the sections for landmarks showing the existing steel and its profiles and the Tischler steel units that we are going to propose to replace. Next, please. Back to our uh, basement windows where we are not visible from 78th Street and then the faux double hung, so you can't get double hung in steel, which show us the mutton bar pattern um, eight over one or eight over two in this case for the two that are visible on the, on the north side. And next, the last sheet shows the terrace doors. There you go. The terrace doors are uh, matching the original. And the last unit on the lower right-hand corner is the one that's not visible from the street. So in closing, we're asking that you consider whether shifting the terrace door 13 on our setback terrace on the rear facade of 965 Fifth is something that the community board could support. Thank you. Okay, 
Do we have any raised hands from the public? Seeing no raised hands from the public, we are going to go to the committee members. And we are going to start with Elizabeth. I'm very sorry I had such terrible sound for most of this that oh. I'm not sure what w w went on. So I don't feel that I can comment. But uh, I think from the little bits I caught, that the original windows the original, uh, were six over one. And I think I can support this if anybody can find out whether it is or heard enough to to know whether it actually uh, is replicating the original fenestration, because that's something that I always ask for, but I don't know whether they did, because I couldn't hear enough over, over all the static. Sorry about that. That's okay. The, they are, we're matching the Mun bar count. So if it's six over one or eight over one, that's what we're matching. What, what you are what? Uh, there are six over one and there are eight over one and we're matching the window mutton pattern to the size of the masonry opening. Okay. Okay, we can move to Gail. Thanks, Aida. Um, a question regarding visibility from the street. You said it was only from the north side that somebody could see the change. Am I correct? You travel west on 78th Street, and that's you can see uh, two two units above the uh, railing, and that those are the units 12 and 13 from the north. And then you can see the south side as you're walking, absolutely parallel to it. You can look up the side of our building, you can see units 11 and 10, which will be eight over one double hung steel, well, faux double hung steel units to match the existing. Yeah, I have just questions or concerns just a little bit in shifting uh, number 13, only mm -hmm. because sadly the entire building seems to have become somewhat of a hodgepodge with all the changes in the windows the way they are. And I'm just concerned that the more adjustments rather than keeping with something that's more uniform just starts to become even uh, more noticeable. But uh, that would be my only concern. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, I'm sorry. I have to apologize also. I really couldn't follow this. I heard, I too heard bits and pieces. Um, I'll only ask this question. Does this building have a master plan for windows? Um, no, there was no master plan. Yes. Um, might be a good idea for, for them to get a master plan. I have to say, I really missed a lot of the presentation. I heard something about a door. Uh, is there a door? I'm trying to put it together. I think I'm really yeah. best off stepping the, stepping aside, David. I don't know what your protocol is for that, but. I think, uh, well, Anthony is running the show on this one, maybe. All right, well. Ask for some clarification. Yeah, but if you can hear me accurately, there are two windows, numbers 12 and 13. 12 is, has a uh, brick wall above it and 13 has a window above it. Right. 12, the landmarks approved, we could shift it wherever we wanted. 13, right. they felt that we should reconsider moving it because there is a double hung window directly above it and we're moving it out of line. So it's not window number number 13, which we'd like to change to a terrace door, which is really the crux of the presentation. And our, where our argument is that when you walk, when you view the rear elevation, they have so lost control over the, the uh, patterning that our shift of 15 inches will make no difference in the overall look of the building. So in my trying to understand, do you have a slide that shows that window, number 13, but yeah. so, it's, so it's above a terrace. Where's your number 13 here? Where's, 
Go back one, Saida. There Show it is. It. Nope. That's it right here. That's it. Um, exactly. Tw number 12 has a brick bricked wall in above it. There's an awning. So that's why you see that white line. Number 13 used to line up with the double hung above it. We're asking to shift it to the left uh, 15 inches, one foot three. And that's because there's a terrace under that? Um, it, there, it, we are on a set book that terrace um, so that you is can't- there a, Is there any other door there? There's that? one, yes, but the way the floor plan works, the door is captured in another room off, off a dressing room. So it's uh, what we're trying to do is increase access to the terrace off a bedroom where there currently is no way out to the oh, terrace. Over okay. window. But that's a fully functioning, safe terrace that oh, has yeah. been cleared for people to walk on. Oh yeah, it's private and owned by the owner of the apartment. It came okay. with a, a so, three-sided so, terrace. Yeah. So as I look at this, the dimensions of the two windows, 13C, two together, what's their height and width? And then tell me the height and width of the door that you're replacing them with. Right. The current window 12 and 13 are 48 inches wide by about five and a half inches, five feet, six inches high. We're replacing them with 48 inch wide double terrace doors. So it's 48 to 48, no change in width and no change in the head because they all hit a beam at eight feet. So when we extend the window down past the railing, you will not know uh, uh, it is a door, except that when you do a terrace door, the historic terrace doors have horizontal mountains where the windows are six vertical or one. Okay, so what will the new now? Do you have another slide showing what the new terrace door will look like? Right here, bottom of this this panel. Uh, that she there you go. If you pull up, it is this is the it is existing versus proposed. So the drawing above shows window, window, door. Go, yeah. Wait, the, point to what you're talking about. What, what are you talking about? What, yeah. There you go. Your point, Proposed okay. Elevation, see the red photo, red photo? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Go up one, that's the elevation. Yeah. Or 13, 12 is the first terrace door on the right underneath the awning. You see the arrow, existing window locations. Terrace door is number 12. And number 13 and number 14. You have three terrace doors right in a row behind the railing in a red box. That's our apartment, 12C. That's our apartment. Oh, that's your that's your maquette of the terrace door. Yeah, that's our that's no, our no, I'm saying what will the door look like? Take a look at the door. It's a six six lights, horizontal bars, six lights wide. Point to it. I don't know where it, you're it, 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 Michelle. Uh, yeah. Maybe if we went to the last slide, which is okay. a slide that shows the more go. of the detail of the door, and okay. it's up a little higher, so you right do. all the way down in the bottom, last sheet in the presentation of the terrace doors. There you go. They're they're showing now. Excellent. That's so the terrace door the, historically. Oh, and so that's, that's the point. horizontal mullions yes. that you're talking right. about that's versus right. right, and it opens like a French door in that there's yes. it's, it's divided in two, and it's regular glazing. Right. All right, so yes. to sum up to make sure I have it, it seems everybody else has, but I found this very difficult. Um, okay. This door, in the same within the same opening, dropping it a little bit, which will disappear behind the terrace, um, will be moved how many inches to the? Um, about 12, 12 inches uh, to the right for, win for window slash door 12, and one foot three to the left for window slash door 13. Okay. And it's only 13 that Landmarks felt was, was controversial. They allowed us to move 12, they said, wherever we wanted, because there's no window above us that we have to line up with. All right. And the purpose is because there's no other access except right. We're for the dressing room. Right. Yeah. right. Okay. Right. I, I can, after all is said and done, I can go along with this. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sorry about the acoustics here. Okay, Saida. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah. Hi. Um, thank you, Michelle, for asking those questions because I needed that uh, tutorial as well. 
Um, I think that um, that that second description helped me understand, and um, I um, un unless my colleagues raise uh, anything else, I don't have um, any concerns supporting the. Anthony, do you want to go last? I guess we can go to David. Yeah, I can go last. Okay. Anthony should go last. Can I just see the elevation one last time? Um, so I can you... see, like, I just want to see the relationship of 12 and 13 to what's above. It's sheet A200B, if that mm -hmm. helps. It's very helpful, thank there you. It is. No, no, I have it on. Yeah, A200B. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. And I was not sure whether it was 12 or 13 that required Landmark's approval. 13. 13, okay. The one, the, uh, the, the one to the left, the second one from the left, from the right. There you go. Okay, and that's, so if I'm reading it correctly, they don't align right now anyway. The proposed door has been shifted out of line with the double hung window. The existing uh -oh. window matches, aligns with the existing window on the drawing above, which is existing. And when you look at what we're proposing, we're taking the number 13 and we're shifting it to the left. So the upper elevation, oh, I see 13. Uh, with, I'm still <clears throat> okay. Well, take a look, well, at, the, yeah, take a look at the photograph uh, with the red arrow. With the yeah, I'm looking photograph. at the grass with the red arrow, and it there says exist, you existing see apartment, window. Yeah, twelve C in the white box. The first red box is our window, the window that is number twelve, and oh, the okay. one to the left is number you're thirteen. Looking, all right, so you're looking at the elevation. Okay, you're yeah. looking at the the building itself. Right, I thought that was could be clear because you can see that the only thing you can see when you're walking down 78th Street are those two old windows. Right, and what and the, the red box, is 12, what the red box is, is that it's shifted to the left. Yes, correct? we're trying. We did a mock up to see what the whether you could what you could see, and also the context to see that while we're shifting there, you can see how the windows don't hold a pattern on any of the floors, and then they move from the traditional window to a casement window. And, and that the, that lack of rigor um, gave us, I said, permission to shift that door over and, and a pedestrian wouldn't even know the difference. Okay, if the intent is to create more chaos, uh, I don't have no, a problem. No, it's actually- I'm jesting, no, I'm jesting. You don't have to take it too seriously. Oh, good. You didn't, and you didn't hear me, hear me say that I could live with it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, who's next? Marco? Okay. Marco, 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 I think is next. Thank you. Thank you, um, Anthony. Well, uh, I'm sorry to, to hear that you are coming for 13 inches, 12 inches in, in a modern building, in a rear facade, 120 feet high. Mm -hmm. It is a cacophony of windows in the back. Nobody can understand that you move one inch, two inches, 10 inches. It doesn't make no sense at all. I mean, I just totally support your application. And I, I feel very bad for you that your audio was, uh, was not in the way that we expect. But I think I totally support your application. A couple of inches doesn't have no sense. In the, doesn't destroy anything at all. And this is a modern building, period. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. And I think Kimberly is next. Yes, but we also have a raise hand from Michelle. So just noting that. Oh. 
Um, Kimberly, go ahead. Thanks, Ada. I'll be brief. Um, based on what I've heard here, there's really nothing to be upset about with this application, so I can support it. Okay, thank you. And Michelle? Yeah, I just wondered, Anthony, can we put it somewhere in the resolution, which it sounds like it's going to be an approval, that we strongly suggest that this building have uh, a master plan? I think we were trying to suggest that to every building that comes before us that doesn't have it. So I think it's worth putting in. I think that's actually, I think that's a pretty good idea. Um, yeah, I think that's a good idea and I'll put something in, um, in okay. there um, along those lines. Great, thank you very much. Okay, and now I get to talk. Uh, um, no, one second, um, we also have raised hands from Marco and again, oh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And my, and Elizabeth, okay. Okay, Marco. Thank you. I would like to propose a motion, and the motion is to oh. If somebody second, I can continue. Is anybody well, can second the application? Anthony yeah. hasn't had a chance to speak. I haven't had a chance to speak. Oh, no, she has only, this is a motion, doesn't mean that the question has been called. A motion is just only we can keep the debate. It's just only the motion is on the floor to be approved. And then later, obviously, you can continue and somebody can call the question. But apparently, okay. nobody, nobody second me. Therefore, it's not valid my, <laughs> my motion. <laughs> that is the rubber rules. Yeah, Sorry. but usually we don't, we don't call the question. Usually we go through everybody and then No, I just... didn't call the question, Anthony. I didn't call the question. I propose okay. a motion to approve, which is yeah. after that, if somebody second, the, the discussion can continue and the opinions can continue until somebody else approves or okay. all the question. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. Uh, Elizabeth? I wanted to say, following what uh, Michelle said, uh, asking for a master plan to add to that that replicates the original fenestration. We've had some, yes, we've yes, yes, had some course. horrible master plans. So I would prefer that that was in there. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry. I, for me, that would have gone without saying at this point, um, especially in this building. Um, all right, just my very brief comments. Um, I, I, think this is, I think this is absolutely perfectly fine. None of the windows on the back line up at this point anyway and window uh, uh, terrace door 14 doesn't really align with the window above it, which is narrower. Um, and so uh, I, I think this is really, um, this is silly. Um, and so I think uh, I can certainly support this. So who, so Marco made a motion. Does someone want to second it? We have a second from Gail. Okay, and David and Michelle. Okay, so Saida, if you would call the roll, please. Okay, just give me one second to unmute everyone. Okay. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes. Gail? Oh no, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Michelle? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Uh, and I guess David? Anthony's gonna yes. go last on this one? Yes. Okay. Marco? Yes. Kimberly? Yes. And Anthony? Yes. Wonderful. Thank, yeah, you. thank you very much. Thank you, David. And do we have any old business? Thank you very much. Thanks for your help, Saida. Thank you. No problem. We do have some old business. We're not finished. Okay, um, let's go with the old business. Laura? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Laura Sakin from Friends of the Upper East Side. Uh, we uh, would like to bring up the 
old slash new business of 210 E62nd, uh, which we've heard from uh, uh, neighbors that might be coming back to the commission as a meeting item on February 22nd. Um, I'm not sure if everyone remembers this just by the address. This is the Treadwell Farm Historic District application with a rooftop and three-story rear yard addition that was approved back in 2016. Uh, the as-built rooftop addition was constructed not according to plans and the architect has come, <coughs> excuse me, the architect has come back to the community board in September of 2020 and May of 2021 with an application to legalize uh, this altered uh, rooftop. That application was scheduled to be heard at LPC on June of last year and then it was later laid over and has never come back as a hearing item. And uh, we were informed that it's coming back as a meeting item. We have reached, France has reached out to LPC's um, legal department to ask that this item comes back as a hearing item so the public can uh, comment on it. And we would also ask that it comes back to the the community board as well prior to going to LPC as a hearing item as it should be, not a meeting item. So this is just to alert us that it's going to come back to us, but we don't know yet. Yeah. So we don't know yet. Well, we we don't. But if we uh, we've been told by residents that have been in contact with LPC that this item is coming back on the twenty second, which is next week, as a meeting item at LPC. So then it's not coming to us. As 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 it stands, now that I'm aware. Um. And is there any way to get it from the and then come to us first? We have, re we have reached out to John Wise, LPC Council. Uh, we've been asking them to have this item come back as a hearing, uh, as it should be, since it's a different application than the one that was approved in 2016. Uh, we don't understand why it's being scheduled as a meeting item. And uh, my, <clears throat> our recommendation is that maybe the community board could reach out to LPC to uh, also ask that the applicant comes back to the community, to the community board uh, prior to going to LPC. If I understand you correctly, there have been no changes since the last time we saw it, and all they want to do is legalize it? Um, uh, I've been told that there has been significant changes. Yes, indeed, it's a completely uh, different uh, application uh, from what was approved in 2016, from what was built, and from what you've seen. So... So to the best of your knowledge, have they, did they stop building? To the best of my knowledge, they have stopped building. I am not, um, yeah. Well, the bottom line is that if it's changed from what we saw last time, then it should come back to us. And uh, it, Friends also believes that uh, because it, this is significantly changed and built uh, not in compliance with the 2016 permit that would, it doesn't, this application has not been heard during uh, a hearing at all uh, since 2016. So it seems that it's inappropriate for it to be coming back as a meeting item only. Okay. David, we also have a raised hand from a member of the public, Julianne Britannia. Okay. Again, confirm unmuting. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, great. David, I just wanted to come on because I uh, had pushed, uh, put an email out to um, John Weiss after um, we met with you guys back in May and we appreciated all the support that you gave us. Um, we've been fighting this, as you know, since 2016. It feels like it's never going to be um, out of our system at this point. But the reality is that, um, as Laura said, there is not a hearing posted. After speaking with John Weiss to bring it up, uh, where does this stand? Just really checking in. Um, I realized that they were trying to put it on the agenda for, as Laura said, 222. Um, we don't see it on the agenda yet. It may come up on Friday, uh, but the reality is it gives us very little time to react and get the neighborhood to put letters together and elected officials. So I don't know if you have any suggestions for us as a neighborhood. I am open to any suggestion because you're much more um, you know, familiar with these processes than, than we are. We've clearly suffered. This is a building, if you were to walk down the streets today, you would see it the whole rear is completely open to the elements. There's just a netting on every floor, four floors. And in the front, there's still windows that are open to the elements. The scaffolding is down. It has over $640,000 in outstanding violations, totally not addressed. Um, I know we're not here to talk about the character of this owner, but the owner hasn't even attempted to relieve any of these. Um, so I'm just surprised that LPC is even allowing him to go forward with any meeting without these violations being addressed. Um, and that's a real concern. My second concern is that the building, if, if LPC is in a position to take it, their responsibility to preserve this structure, they are not doing anything and neither is DOB to force that they enclose this building. It's an open shell, uh, both in parts of the front and completely in the back. And uh, just as a third item to maybe ask for your help and or any advice, um, I did reach out to council member Menon and council member Powers to ask that they place a phone call to Chair Carroll or to John uh, Weiss to request that this become a public hearing. I think it's completely unfair to not let the public have some say in this matter at this point. We've gone for many years and from the little I've seen, the drawings that have come back, I, I don't want to be quoted on it, but my understanding is that LPC has asked them to take down the rooftop structure, which we all know from our previous presentation is actually on two neighboring properties having trespassed. Um, but there's still the rear uh, wall problem in the rear of the house and the discussion of the extended 17 feet back is being ignored at this point which is a real concern for our neighborhood and our gardens. Um, so that's as much as I know at this point, the, we're, the immediate push is to get it to be, as, as Laura said, to ask it to be a public hearing versus just an LPC meeting. But I do know that John Weiss said in his email that this uh, person sometimes says they're coming forward with information and don't show up with updated information as they're expecting. Hence, since we met last May, nothing has moved forward because they have not come forward with updated plans. I can't offer you any expertise in terms of getting your community behind it. I think you're better at that than we are. Uh, but I think we can uh, talk to uh, our board chair and uh, perhaps we can get a letter out quickly. Uh, requesting that if this is going to come back to landmarks and it's been changed from what we've already seen, then it should come to us first. And, okay, uh, that would be great and helpful. I think, I think that's about all we can do at this point as a committee and as a um, and as a board. Uh, certainly open to suggestions if anyone else has a suggestion. We also have a raised hand from Michelle. Confirm unmuting Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. yeah, I, I agree. Um, I was going to su suggest that, so I'm glad we can do that. I'm sure Russell will do that. But I think somewhere in that, attached to that letter, should be our former resolution because we turned it down, right? Exactly. Uh, 
Yeah, the former resolution and also, I don't know what the minutes reflected, I don't recall, but if it if the minutes did reflect the bad actors and the um, community concern, if that's in the minutes of the meeting, I think the minutes of the meeting should be attached also um, to give to give um, LPC a little background is an additional background as to what's going on here. I'm sure Ju uh, Julianne uh, has has given them history and with her own letters is making it all known. But it's it's interesting to me that if this building it remains open to the weather and their their construction and design plans you know, somehow they they think that they're going ahead with that. I don't know how they can since it's further decaying, you know, while it's open. It just seems like a really irresponsible owner. But of course, it's uh, his money. But nobody else really wants to live with his irresponsibility. So if we can get as much as we can attached to the current letter, and I would stress asking them to come back to us and not asking them just to have a hearing at Landmarks. I mean, I think we should make no, that very I, clear. No, yeah. The letter I'm suggesting has already said that they should be coming to back bring to it us back. First. Right. I agree. I'm sure Russell will agree to that. Okay. However, you also have a raised hand from Marco. Marco, confirm and muting. Uh, I think. Um, about landmarks, every, everything has been said. With respect uh, with the conditions of the property, uh, you had to ask directly to Mrs. Uh, Julie Menon to call directly to DOB. And DOB will be send the inspectors to assess what are you described. And they th those inspectors will, ma will make a determination if it's in, in bad conditions, always this construction has been stopped properly because there are some regulations when you stop the construction. Uh, we respect the violations. Uh, don't worry about it. At the time when they sell, usually the um, Department of Finance, they catch the, the, the owner. So don't worry about, about the money because uh, I see in so many cases that when they sell the buildings, the city said, that is my money. So that is the point. So don't worry about that. They all, they just go directly to DOV. DOV will set an inspector and they, he will make a final decision about the problem. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Saida, I'm gonna ask you to uh, see between you and Will if uh, you can uh, pull up the last resolution and the minutes. And uh, why don't you uh, send copies to the committee and also to Russell and I'll get in touch with Russell and tell him that we would like to uh, pursue this as quickly as possible. Okay, will do. Okay. Any other comments on this? We'll do everything we can, Julianne. No other Sounds reasons. like you have your own work cut out for you. <clears throat> I don't understand what the motives are because benign neglect lost us the hospital on Roosevelt Island. All they had to do was put a roof on it and they never did. So it would be a shame to uh, lose this building as well, which may be what's really beneath the radar, benign neglect, and then the building department comes along and says it's in such bad shape and has to be torn down. I don't know that it's there yet. You would know better than I. Okay. Anyway, I can't, I can't hear Julianne. I um, don't know if it's to the point of um, neglect to that level. And as Marco stated, DOB has been out here quite a bit, but they can't always get into the building. Um, it's padlocked and 
the owner never shows up to let them in. But from the back area where it's open, people have said that there's three feet of water in the basement. Um, and obviously people's who in these townhouses, we have common walls. So the, the homes on either side are, are seeing water damage to their homes potentially. Um, I'm not an expert, um, but it would be great if LPC could ever request that an independent surveyor comes out and looks at this building. Um, he's just a bad, a bad actor. And I know when we came before you, we showed you a project that he has since 2008 outstanding in Staten Island. I Googled that project just to see a Google maps of where it is. It's still an overbuilt, overreaching, vacant property with a fence around it, never completed. And that's out there since 2008. So this is not his first time at this rodeo. So we're just dealing with, honestly, a bad character that we all wish would go away. But in the meantime, we have to, you know, follow the rules as, as we should. We just wish he would follow the rules. And it's really an uncomfortable situation. It definitely has already, you know, damaged our neighborhood. There's everyone who walks by asks what's going on here. It's years and years of just, you know, a derelict building. And there's no doubt that mosquitoes, rats, birds, who knows? Well, if it's, to, if it's beginning to cause damage in the adjoining buildings, um, that's a further issue for Department of Buildings to latch on to. <clears throat> it's also potentially a lawsuit, but uh, that's, that's, just, that's a whole nother ball game. Um, okay, I think we have a good picture. And I Thank think we you. know what we, we can do. Thank you for all your help. Okay, so Saida, you know how we can, you can help us. Yes, I'll have yeah. an email to you shortly. Okay. And um, any, any other old business? Any new business? Oh, Michelle, oh, I see a hand up. Yeah, I just actually had a question. Um, doesn't landmarks, the Landmarks Commission intervene? Don't they have a responsibility when there's restoration or renovation on a landmarks building for the protection of the, uh, you know, the buildings who are next to them? Didn't we just lose one? Uh, a building just was demolished. Um, somebody was doing renovation and it was, um, I don't remember if it was in a district or an individual landmark, but isn't that part of their responsibility? It is their part of their responsibility, but uh, they always claim they don't have the resources. Uh, and I can tell you that uh, without naming names that I had a client who had a violation. Uh, he no longer is my client because he refused to take care of the violation. And the violation just went on and on and on and to this day. I don't know if it's been taken care of. Uh, and it's a very public, uh, visible violation. So I can't explain landmarks uh, and their lack of action on some of these issues. Okay, thank you. Not much to thank me for on that one. <laughs> Okay, uh, new business. I raised guess we hands. need. Hmm? No raised hands for new. Oh, we have Marco. Okay. Marco is going to. I make was a going to, to call adjourn. the motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Did you hear what I said? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. I see all these thumbs up, so I guess we're adjourned. Thank uh, you. So enjoy the rest of Valentine's Day. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm.